All right, guys, you guys know I want to begin with an audio check. I'm always, I'm always messing with stuff, moving cameras, changing out laptops, messing with my settings. Let's make sure we're, make sure we're good and clear. Sound is great. Thank you. Sound is great. Coffee's good. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I got the light. I got the light. I've got my lighting really low in the studio right now. But for those of you who haven't noticed, the entire studio has been redone. All the books are in different positions. It's now organized according to research the way I need it done. Oh, I've got a whole series and volumes, encyclopedia sets from the 1800s all in here. Every This is my 1800s and 1700s. This whole shelf here is 1700s. A lot of, half of the ones from the 1700s are all on chronology. <clears throat> I got another shelf way down here. I'm, I'm just wrapped around. I got a lot of big books. Some of the books from the 1800s are just so big they won't fit on the shelf. So I, I stack them sideways. There's some back there too. Uh, I just have things where it's a lot easy, easier to access as I'm giving presentations. Uh, yeah. So uh, I have I have a few I have a few announcements. One, I know you guys have seen this, and a lot of people have donated me art. They've donated different things. This is very impressive. I'm gonna show this to you close up. The detail, the color. This is really impressive. This was done by Max Steele in Australia, and I'm aware that he's done portraits for Martin Leakey, uh, my buddy, and uh, Campbell, autodidactic. Uh, he's also doing one of Danny. Yeah, he, he's making Danny look like a rock star. I'm a little jealous, but uh, but you know what? <clears throat> a lot of people have sent donations and books. They've sent donations and different things, and they haven't all been acknowledged. I used to try to acknowledge them all the time, but life gets so chaotic. All that traveling back and forth to San Diego and North Carolina, and then doing meetups here locally. Uh, uh, we've had some we've had some things go on in our lives too. Uh, you know, I, I literally stayed in the hospital for days, even even spent some nights uh, with Don. Um, so, guys, it's a uh, it, it's really easy to lose track of all the things that we get because on a daily basis, more emails come in. More, so Dawn's almost absolutely caught up with all the orders. And that's amazing considering how sick she was. So uh, I haven't been trying to push anything, no, no, ever, uh, merchandise. But I'm about to give all this. I can't say it's free because he painted this beautiful, this beautiful uh, mural. So I'm going to give him this archaic tote bag full of archaic stuff. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna send him some stickers to Australia for I got one on the back of my motorcycle, the back of my Jeep, and the back of my van. Uh these right here are like weatherproof decals. Some of y'all seen these. We've already mailed a couple hundred of these out. A lot of y'all ordered them. Break free or die trying. But Max, if you're listening, Don's gonna see and send you an email. Well, I need to know what you and your significant other have your preferences because we've got different styles different colors we got long sleeves we got short sleeves we got gray and black and like a beige off color uh i just need to know what your preferences are and your sizes for for you and your significant other and i'm gonna send these to you and this mug there's the flammarion you guys know one of my favorite paintings that's that guy looking out of the simulation what does he see more constructs yeah guys we're immortals. That's what this video is about. I don't make claims lightly. You know every time that I told you I'm going to blow your mind, I did it. And this is another one of those videos. You're going to see absolute evidence. 340-something photos I've prepared. Some of them are very difficult to come by. But these photos... They're proof we're, we're, we're living in a simulated construct. And at one time in the past, somebody decided to pull the plug. And it was an instantaneous shutdown. Somebody locked the holography down. And whatever was going on, the flow of water, the blowing of the wind, falling of rain, no matter what was going on, everything froze in place. 
animals being born, animals being eaten, creatures being spun up in webs. Whatever was happening at that instant was recorded forever. It was imprinted into the holosphere. We see it as fossils. I'm going to show you some fossils that are going to blow your minds. I've done, I did a presentation on fossils before. No, it's not, it's not even comparable to what I'm going to show you in this video. So yeah, I'm going to send, I'm going to send a, a Max Steel, all this, all the logos are on the bag. All, all the logos for uh, all the catchphrases and logos. The deal, but I'm also going to, I don't know if I have any. Yeah, I got one. I'm also going to send him my, my, my combo super survival pack. This has got 100% of all my research data for the entire 25 years I've been doing all this. Every book I've ever written, published and unpublished, over 200 articles I've written on a variety of topics, my research notes, unpublished notes, thousands of images, thousands of PDF books I've used for my research. It's all, it's all on here and a whole lot more. Almost every image you have ever seen in any video and on my whole YouTube is right here in this combo. I'm going to send this to him too. That's how much I appreciate this. So that's one item. The other item is a very rare book. Here it is. Okay. I've told you guys about this book many times. History of the Christian religion to the year 200. My dark scriptures playlist. This is one of the source materials where I'm showing you that uh, got, got a, lot of, a lot of stuff to learn about the development of Christianity before you sit before you sit there and just accept everything at face value, how that New Testament was put together is something you need to educate yourself on. You need to know. It was all perfectly described in this book. This book is over 100 years old. It is absolutely packed full of amazing information. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because I accidentally obtained a second copy. My first trip to Book Tree in San Diego, Paul he had a copy set aside for me. It's it's right here. This is it right here. This is the exact same book, History of the Christ Christian Religion. Well, I don't need two copies. I don't need two copies. As a matter of fact, we are deep into the archaic cataloging project right now. This is what Big John's doing. We're done photographing all the images. That's another thing. I got another drive full of all the images. You're not going to believe it. It's thousands and thousands of amazing images of, of all these woodcuts and prints and metal engravings and all these illustrations and photographs from all the books in this library and all the, all from all the books that are stacked up in the garage that were not included in this library for whatever reason. But I'm offering this book. I'm not going to put a price on it, but there's no reason for me to have a book that so many other people have asked me for. There's only one book. There's many of you. Some of you guys have can find it as PDFs. You can download this as a free PDF for research purposes. There's others of you that are just like me who want the book. You want, you want the actual book. <coughs> My second trip to San Diego, I was going through the bottom shelves that were buried in other boxes of books at the book tree, and I pulled this out. Paul Tice didn't even know he had another copy. So I bought it. I bought it too. Thinking, uh, thinking, not thinking clearly. I didn't, I wasn't sure if I, on my first trip, I had obtained a copy. I thought I did, but I wasn't here. I was in San Diego. So I didn't want to risk coming back to Texas, not, not possessing the book. So I went ahead and just bought it. And then when I got back, I found out I had another copy. So Email me if you're interested in it. All I'm going to ask for is the cover price and co and to cover the expense of mailing it to you. I'm not asking for any more than that. But uh, uh, at Book Tree, this is a $25 book. And just if you're international, uh, we'll we'll go through the details. But just email me if you're one of the ones that would really like to possess this book. I don't need two copies. All right. All my email addresses are on archaics.com. <clears throat> my YouTube, my YouTube videos don't have a lot of links anymore. I'm not putting a lot. I'm only putting one link on each video now, and it's to it's to my website, archaics.com, and it's a full list, literally 70 or 80 links to all archaics research uh, uh, resources, and a whole bunch of stuff is free. Just go over there and start downloading stuff. It's all free. Yeah, of course, there are things you can buy. My publisher's not going to sell my uh, give away my books. He's got to make money. 
All right, guys. <clears throat> so, thank you, moderators. Thank you for posting that PDF for those for those who who, are, who aren't able. You can get a, a copy of that book for free. Thank you. Appreciate that. I don't know who posted it, but I appreciate it. I think that's Shiva. That's good. All right, guys. We got some serious presentation to get into. This is something serious. And just like last time, last time I did a presentation where I showed like 100 images was like last week when Dom was in the hospital. I ran over to my other studio and I and I did that video on the uh what was that video? Oh, the video on all the alchem the alchemical showing the phoenix and all these uh alchemy illustrations. All right. Let's see here. I'm going to go ahead. Y'all let me know if I'm sharing my screen right now. Let me know in the, in the I just need to know what you, I need to see what you see. I'm trying to figure it out. Do you see me trying to share my screen at all? No, you just see me? All right. All right, so let's look at this. All right. We're going to try this again. Oh, but first, I do know that I did have something else. Okay, uh, in, in my research to put this video together, I came across something very odd. Um, it's odd because this guy's been on YouTube. He's got 87,000 subs. I, uh, his subject matter, there's a lot of crossover with Archaics. I've never heard of him before. His name is John Adolfi. Uh, I came across his channel called Law. His, his channel's called, called John Adolfi, but his website is Lost World Museum. He talks about a bunch of fossils. But I, I lifted two things from him. One of them, was the fact I was looking at the petrified vehicle tracks on Malta and in Texas, and I found references to more in Arizona and New Mexico. So I found uh, I'm, I'm providing the links in the description box at the end of this video to go to his channel and go to his website because, uh, like Jonathan Gray, beforeus.com, these are researchers you need to look into. They've done their homework. This guy is very presentable. I listened to two of his videos earlier today, and this and that's, that's what allowed. Basically, I came to the decision. I'm going to share. I'm going to share his material with you. Now, 99.9% .9 of this video is is all my, my research, but I have to give credit. This right here, uh, I will show you the two pictures uh, I got from his website. It's fantastic. So, uh, I'll be providing those links here, here in a little while concerning the vehicle tracks and giant clams and where they've been found. It's amazing. So. <clears throat> uh, I covered Max Steele in that beautiful portrait, and I covered the the Christian book. So we're good. We're good now. All right. I'm going to put this aside. And now I'm going to share my screen. One of these days, I'm going to be an expert at StreamYard. All right, present, share screen. I don't know why this isn't letting me share screen like last time. What is going on here? Did it just share screen? Okay, there it is. All right, so I'm going to be screen sharing now. 
I got it. I just got to put you guys aside. I see. I see now how to do this. All right, you see this. This is a picture all by itself before I get to these albums. The reason I'm showing you this, this picture is because the great white shark is one of the leading arguments in the scientific community and those who, who follow uniformitarian thinking. The great white shark is virtually unchanged from its predecessors. Now, when creationists and when others who are critics of the evolutionary uh, uh, model come forth and say, hey, if evolution is true, how come the great white shark skeletons uh, and fossils are identical to the great white sharks we have today? And the answer from the scientific community at face value really sounds correct. It really sounds right. They say, oh, the great white shark. The great white shark is an apex predator. Apex predators don't need to evolve. They're already at the height of their, of their uh, development. The average ordinary thinking individual would take that as an acceptable response. But the problem is these same uniformitarians practice exclusions. In the practicing of exclusions, they absolutely omit a tremendous amount of data in order to pass that off as a fact. Let me explain. There is no evolutionary development from what is claimed to be a 66 million year old great white shark and a great white shark of today. The only thing that's kind of odd, though, is that the earlier versions were larger. So this is the apex argument, apex predator argument. I'm going to completely dismantle that position in this video. I'm going to do it absolutely logically, showing you all the scientific photos from the uniformitarians themselves that basically tear apart that entire concept. So this is a yeah, the apex predator argument is the number it's the number one defense in the scientific community as to why some life forms are absolutely unchanged. 66 million years is a long time. It's really hard for me to believe that some of these pictures I'm going to show you of creatures are 66 million years old. Yeah, I'm a doubter, guys. You already know it. I'm a doubter. So before I, before I get deep in the presentation, I'm about to go right now. One last audio check, and I'm diving deep. Y'all let me know you hear me. Hey, Tiger Turtle. Somebody's handle is your least favorite YouTube channel? Wow. They got smaller because nymphs are magical. Wow, I can't even, can't even believe I just wasted time reading that. All right, audio good. Thanks, guys. That's, that's enough. So, I'm going to tell you now, in, in the field of medicine, doctors, they practice medicine. This is what they do. This is what it's called. It also gives them a, a great latitude in making mistakes so they don't, they, don't, they don't suffer the consequences of their errors. But you know what? In legal parlance, it's called practicing law. Well, after this video, you're probably going to agree with me that and when it comes to scientific analysis, it should be called practicing science because none of this is factual. This whole paradigm that's been, been put upon us and the origin of fossils, the way things are fossilized, none of it's true. The whole sedimentation hypothesis uh, that they promote is fact. It's not true. That's not how fossils are created. Fossils are created over long periods of time due to pressure and sedimentation and, and then dehydration. And then minerals and silicates replace, replace the biology as cellular structures break down. It's all bullshit. It's all bullshit. I'm going to show you fossils that cannot exist by that model. They just can't. So in dealing with anything, yeah, in dealing with anything that's going to... Uh, go from getting more and more complex, 
we have to start with the simple. Because by starting with the simple, your own mind is going to be making conclusions before I'm able to say them. Pay attention to what you see. So we're going to move in here. Full screen share mode. Right here. <coughs> we start very simple. Now, according to evolutionary uh, uh, paleobotany, this is a very complex form. It's a flower. Just a simple flower. I have so many slides that we're going through some of these sections rather fast. There's a mushroom. In about 100 million years, according to the, the, according to the model, mushrooms haven't changed a bit. Fungus doesn't evolve. It just exists. I mean, this is what the fossils show us. Look at that mushroom right there. And I'm not, I'm not just, I'm just not assigning, I'm not assigning what something is based off what, what it looks like. I'm actually going by what the scientists claim these objects are. Very easy to verify. There's another mushroom. Another little old mushroom right there. That's a pine cone. At least, at least, that's what the uh, Natural Museum of Sciences says. This is a pine cone. This is, this is the photo taken by me when I was contracting about four years ago. And uh, I don't know what it is. It looks like a bunch of blades of grass or fronds, uh, uh, ferns. They all just laid over in a clump. But I was, I was moving flagstone and turned one over. And that's what I saw. I took pictures of it immediately. This is, this is right here is photographed by me. I don't know what it is. It looks like a plant to me. There's a different perspective. Those are my old reading glasses right there. I don't know what it is. It looks like plants with fronds on the ends. I don't know. Maybe you saw seed pods or small leaves on the end. Pure speculation. I don't know what it is. It's easy to tell what that is. Let me, let me blow that up for you. It's real easy to tell what that is. Those are flowers. Or so, or, or it looks like flowers. It's some type of plant. Look at that one. Look at that. Look at the detail in that. 66 million years of earthquakes, of all kinds of detritus and bolide impacts, all kinds of things that are supposed to have happened in the past 66 million years. In the past 66 million years, our world should have been hit, according to their model, should have been hit millions of times with all kinds of bolides and the earthquakes, volcanism, volcanic resurfacing, addition to pressure, seabed slipping their basins, to uh, lithospheric displacement, all these concepts that are given to us. And yet they're kept so compartmentalized, one does never disturb the other. Here we have this beautiful little design right here. How did it survive 66 million years? We can't even keep up with the lawnmowers that we bought in the 1980s. Nobody knows where the 1980s lawnmower is. You don't know. <coughs> it's crazy. Look at that leaf. Look at the detail in that leaf. The veins, very clear. Rigid, the ridges on the leaf. It's not 66 million years. And nor does, nor does the idea of, of pressure, sedimentation, and their whole, their whole, uh, their whole, their whole, their whole concept of of fossils taking long periods of time to to make can't explain this leaf but this is a simple form we haven't even got to any of the good stuff in this video it's going to be a minute this this is but this is just it's an oversimplification to say that this is a part of the fossilization process it's not it's not it's a leaf it would have been destroyed by all processes of nature it's a leaf look at that a clump of grass I know some of you creative, real creative individuals are going to try to claim it's a xenomorph. I got it. But that's just that's just plant. It's all plant right there. Those leaves. Just a weird angle. Here, you know what? I, I didn't blow that up for y'all. I didn't blow it up for you. There it is. Here's some more plants. Go through this. There's more flowers. There they are right there. I'm moving through this because I'm just showing you that Fossils are not the exception. They are the norm. They're everywhere. You can go on eBay and Etsy right now, and there are tens of thousands of fossils for sale. These are the ones that are not in people's private collections. 
Not to mention that our world still possesses 99.9% .9 of fossils that have never been found. So, look at the, look at the intric intricacy here. Look at that detail. Look at this. It's three-dimensional, guys. This is 3D right here on a 2D surface. This is what you're looking at. Fossils didn't do that. No pressure did that. Something else happened. You're going to understand as you see more pictures. Something else happened. These weren't crushed. They weren't mangled. They are in the exact way they looked in life. Yeah. There's another one. Beautiful. That, that is exactly how one a frond looks today. All you got to do is cut it off. Lay it, lay it on, uh, lay it on uh, uh, a floor somewhere. And that's what it looks like today. 66, 70 million years old, years old. Come on. Look at that. Look at that detail. <coughs> nope. Something else happened, guys. Something terrible happened. But it wasn't fossilization. Oh, by the way, I know I know most of you don't need to hear this. But there are no fossils being created today by natural processes. Only artificially. Look at that. Look at that. They still maintain the shape they had in life. Look at that. What happened? Because it sure wasn't a fossilization process. It sure wasn't a bunch of pressure. It sure wasn't a whole immense amount of weight and water and slow dehydration to allow silicates to come in and replace all, all the, the prior uh, vegetation composition. That's, that's not what happened here. Look at this. Plants. That's a plant. Look at that. No, guys, it's not a creature. I know you want to think it's a creature. I've been fooled before, too. All right. Plants. The detail. Now, here's what, here's what I want you to understand. You're looking at a 3D image on a 2D surface. Process that. The fossilization, the fossilization process, the processes that are involved could have not produced that. But we're going to get to it. We're going to get to it. These are all really, really weak examples. But that's what I chose to start with. There it is. Some more detail. Real nice. Look at that. Beautiful detail. God is truly an artist. Even when he kills an entire ecosphere, he turns it into art. It's beautiful. This is kind of blurry because it was blown up too much. Same thing, a lot of detail. Look at this detail. Look at these leaves. Look at these leaves, guys. It's amazing detail. I can't believe this thing's 66 million years old. Look at that one. Look at that. The veins. I know. I know. I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, Jason thinks he's a geologist. He thinks he's going to teach those, those, those archaeologists something, those uniformitarians. All I'm asking you to do is use your common sense because you're going to see things that are inexplicable by the scientific paradigm. Absolutely inexplicable. We're almost done with this file. Look at the, look at the detail on these plants. The process processes that we're told didn't do this. This is too perfectly preserved. It's beautiful. Look at that. It's almost, it's almost like a, a biological Mandelbrot set. It's amazing. Look at that. Looks looks like it was flash burned on stone, exactly how it looked in real life. Look at that. Look at that detail. Come on. Come on, botanists. Some of you botanists out there, can y'all y'all recognize that, that flower? Look at that detail. There's oh, we've already seen that one. Or or Look at that. Flowers. Oh, here we are. Now we're going to come to our first anomaly. Yeah, what is that thing there? Well, that's a plant. That right there, my friends, is a tree. But the position of that tree in geology qualifies it to be called a polystrate fossil. Polystrate fossils are the bane of uniformitarian geology. Because 
the uniformitarians have a fixed date to the Devonian, the Jurassic, the Triassic, the Permian Basin. Yeah, the, the KT, tertiary boundary and all. Listen, guys, all this arbitrary bullshit is what it is. It's not true. Assigning millions and millions of years to each layer as if as if the world just pancakes and new ages or new pan that's not that's not what we find. A polystrate fossil goes through multiple layers of uniformitarian geology. So is the tree hundreds of millions of years old, or is the dating system BS? Because you don't have any other alternatives. Polystrate fossils have been found all over the world. There's one there. It's a polystrate fossil. It's a tree that was fossilized and then buried. Polystrate fossils. This was a forest. Here's multiple, multiple polystrate fossils sticking straight up in the air. It was a forest. They turned to stone. They go through multiple layers of geology. There's another polystrate fossil. Yeah, guys, you can't fake polystrate fossils. Here's a polystrate fossil with whole root systems intact. So you know it's a tree. Here it is right here. Here's where they're, here's where they're digging out polystrate fossils that are removing them, going through multiple layers of geology. Here's where they've already cut them off. Two of them have the root system still intact. That's a mammoth. That's a big polystrate fossil there. It's still stuck inside of a cliff. All right, that's the last. This polystrate fossil here is the last one of the slide. This is it. Uh, of this one file on plants. We're about to move into a more complex uh, theater now. So. Let me exit that file. Let me put this aside just for a second so I can see my chat. Everything's still go going okay? I just need one or two people to say everything's still okay. Because I spent a long time in that file, and we're going to the next file right now. Perfect. Thank you, Wendy Flores. That's all I need. Just that one person. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Delta Don. Aaron Protocol, Nelson. All right. So, like I said, these fossils are going to get more and more spectacular until you start having some aha moments. Yeah, some real aha moments, guys. What happened to the ancient world was not 66 million years ago. What happened to the ancient world wasn't a cataclysm by any by any species or, or de definitions that we have developed in catastrophism. The two schools of science that have been at war for a long time, since the 18, 1810s and 1820s, is catastrophism, which is older, and uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism is the one the globalists funded, and catastrophism went down. That's why you never hear about it. That's why people like me sound crazy. Because the entire world has been educated to believe in the uniformitarian model, which is not true. What happened to the ancient world happened in the space of a fraction, a fraction of a micron. It was instantaneous. And I'm going to show you absolute proof of this. Now, <clears throat> we're, done with, we're done with the plants. We're going to move on. So the next item up for bid. Let's look at these little humdingers. Yeah. Now we're going to get into something really kind of interesting here. Let's look at these humdingers. Look at that cutie pie right there. That's an ant. Now, if you really want to study ants, I suggest... You just go find an empty field somewhere with a shovel, and I promise you, real quick, you're going to find some ants. Somewhere there's going to be some ants. And if you stand in one place a little too long, I promise you, those ants are going to find you. But this little critter here is supposed to be 40 to 60 million years old, perfectly preserved in amber. Now, today, amber, today, 
tree resin leaks out of trees and it catches insects. And that's exactly what happened in ancient times. But today that that tree resin dissolves with rainwater. Today that tree resin doesn't doesn't harden and petrify and fossilize into beautiful pieces of jewelry that we can we can make. Not without artificial means, not without human interaction, by nat- by processes that are natural. Tree resin dissolves. It just disappears. It doesn't do this. What I am proposing, and you're going to see a lot of images, is that these are the insects that were trapped in resin at the instant when whatever happened, happened. And I'll get to that. This ant is indistinguishable from the ants that exist today. It must be an apex predator. Here, look at these. Here, look at these little insects right here. Look. The moniker on the bottom says ants. I don't know what they are. Maybe they are ants. But I know that's a bee. No, that's I know that's a bee. There's another bee right there. Can't miss that being a bee. A bee that makes honey must be an apex predator. Look at that beetle. I know that any one of you can go to a wood pile somewhere in your neighborhood, like my property, I got a wood pile, I just pick up the wood and I find beetle just like this, no difference. And if it doesn't look like this, it might look like this beetle right here. Or, or I could pick up a brick that's been in my backyard and I might find a beetle that looks like this. <clears throat> yeah, this is ridiculous, guys. Look at this beetle. Look at the detail. 66 to 40 million years ago, guys. This is what we're told. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Be- Look at that creature right there. I wouldn't be surprised if it was. I would not even be surprised, guys, if it was just 6,600 years ago when these poor bastards uh, met their fate. Wouldn't he be surprised? Look at that beetle. No different. Look at that beetle. No different. These beetles exist today. Oh, beetles must be apex predators. Look at that beetle. Man, here's something crazy because I like to fish. And, you know, uh, the fish we can pull up from the old tanks and ponds in Central East Texas right now are no different than these fish right here. How do I know? Because scientists told me right here in these pictures are catfish. These are catfish, guys. These are catfish. These are the apex predators of Central East Texas tanks and ponds and streams. These are right here. It's a catfish. Some of those catfish were pretty big. Look at this. Giant armored catfish. Look at the spines. These are catfish spines. <clears throat> Do you know how many trophies I'd get if I pulled out a catfish that had spines like that today? But then again, they had they were living in a different environment. There's going to be some small changes in their anatomy to accompany the fact that they lived under under a highly pressurized environment with ten times or to a hundred times the oxygen that we have today. Here it is, guys. Catfish. Catfish must be apex predators. Here's another catfish right here. You can't miss that. It's catfish. There's the spines. That's not me saying catfish. There it is right there. On the little top right, right there. Catfish fossil. Can't miss that, guys. Jason's not making nothing up. Here's another apex predator. This is a dangerous apex predator. It is found on linoleum floors and in kitchen bathroom, kitchens and bathrooms all over the world today. This is a true apex predator. It has lasted 66 million years. Centipedes, look at them, apex predators. They're dangerous. Look at that. It's the great white shark of a hundred legs. And of course, everybody knows what a mosquito is. The mosquitoes back then don't look any different than mosquitoes today. They might mosquitoes back then did have some muscles, but they're still the same as today, guys. They're mosquitoes. They were pestering ancient ancient biological life forms just like they, they pester us today. Look at that. No, is that a millipede or no, that's a centipede. That's a centipede. 
This this little bastard right here is in everybody's kitchens today. This is a this is alpha apex predator. This is the cockroach. Yeah. No evolutionary development in 66 million years. My God, I'm going to lose IQ points. Look at that apex predator. That little vicious, dangerous creature is called the cricket. Look, guys, these fossils are not the exception. They are the norm. That's another cricket. Wait a minute. There's another cricket right there. Jiminy Cricket, there's another cricket. Look, they still have their three-dimensional form. Oh, man, look at that cricket. Almost looks like it was painted on there. There's another cricket. That cricket still has body parts. Here, here's, a, here's, a, here's the cousin of a cricket. Looks like a grasshopper right here. 66 million year old grasshopper apex predator. Wow. Now, for those who don't know, the frog is absolutely unchanged in 66 million years. The frogs and toads you have in your backyard are the same frogs and toads that existed 66 million years ago. Process that. Frog, another ribbit. There's Kermit right there. There's a real good specimen of a frog. You can see his his you can see his whole body. Look at that frog. That looks like a tree frog. It's another frog. Look at that one. He's just hanging out. Look at that frog. How did that happen? That's a 3D fossil again. How did that happen? He was frozen in time in that exact moment you see him in right there. I don't know what kind of bug that is. Silverfish? I don't know. That's some type of bug. I don't know. I don't know what kind of bugs these are. There's four of them there. Pretty interesting. I know what kind of bug that is. That's a ladybug. Everybody knows what a ladybug is. They're 66 million years old. Ladybugs are vicious. They're apex predators. There's another one right there. Hanging out with his little buddy. Looks like a baby cricket or something. Right there. Look at that. Now, I can agree with the praying mantis being an apex predator. But truth be told... These apex predators, how come there aren't cricket people out there jumping around? They, they make be the best basketball players. Why ain't there? How come there ain't praying mantis people out there? Why didn't any of these apex predators, you know, become something, you know, intelligent? Why did evolution stop for them? Why? Looks like, I, I, I mean, I, I don't even know why I said that because there's no evidence of evolution at all in any creatures. There are no fossils of transitional forms please process that my friends please process this statement i've shown you all these fossils i'm about to show you about 250 more none of these fossils are evidence of of the development of any transitional forms that's a problem because if we've got fossils according to uniformitarian geology from the Devonian, the old Permian, the, the Permian Basin, if we've got them from the Jurassic and the Triassic, we've got, we've got them from on both sides of the KT boundary, then why, if we have all these fossils, do we not have a fossil that shows a transitional form? When one species is developing into another, we don't. What we have are artist black and white ink illustrations showing us what a transitional form would look like but we don't have photographs that show us these things like we do this 66 million year old praying mantis look at that 66 million years old 
He looks just like the ones in your backyard. Look at that praying mantis. 66 million years old. And remember, guys, there, even today, there's like hundreds of different species of praying mantis. Look at that. Wow, there's a centipede there. Look at that. Some damn mosquitoes. Or a mosquito eater. One of them. You know, this is kind of weird. This one's kind of weird here. They might be mating. One of one of them got stuck in the stuck in the uh, resin. And it was still attached to the other one. They were mating. That's what it looks like to me. I could be wrong. This little poor fella here stuck in this rock. He never saw what's coming. Oh, we're getting to the spiders now. Uh, Jahar Lee, I know you got a, a perennial fear of spiders, but here you go. They're not going. They're not going to reach out and bite you. But these spiders here are apex predators. They're 66 million years old and virtually unchanged in that entire period of time. How come we don't have any arachnoids? How come there isn't a race of people in this world today that have four legs and four arms and can do four times all the stuff the rest of us can do? Why? How come there's no spider people? Spider-Man doesn't qualify because bipedals created that, created him. Yeah, guys, listen, spiders are everywhere in our world today. Everywhere we find spiders, but that's not what I'm showing you. I'm showing you spiders that were 40 to 66 million years ago, according to the uniformitarian model. Look at that. These are 3D specimens. Here they are. Look at that. Detail. The spines on that. They're still all there. How come they're not drilling in here and getting all this old DNA out? Why? It's there. Look at this. Why don't they want to get the DNA out? I'm telling you why. I'm going to tell you why. There's DNA in these. They don't want to, they don't want to publish what they find. There's no difference between the arachnids today and the arachnids of back then, except the amount of oxygen that they took in and the, the uh, pressurized environment they lived in. Yeah, little spider there. Boy, it's mean looking spider. That's a wolf spider. Mean looking little spider. Oh man, there's a family of spiders there. Spider mummies. Boy, they get real creative, don't they? Yeah. The spiders of today don't look any different than the spiders of 66 million years ago. I have a problem with that. I got a problem with that. Oh man, I know a bunch of you as a as a young kid like me used to go play in the creek and pull out crawdads and tadpoles. Well, there's a tadpole right here. This is a tadpole, and you shouldn't be surprised that we have fossilized tadpoles. The reason you shouldn't be surprised is because tadpoles become fossilized frogs. Yeah, tadpole. I'm not making that up. That's what that's what the science book says. Says it's a tadpole. Look at that. That's a tadpole. The science book called it a tadpole. I'm going with what science says. They said that tadpole right there is 66 million years old. Why don't we have frog people around? Why do we not have people descended from frogs? Why? Frogs, are, the tadpole and the frogs are apex predator. So, that file is exhausted. We have gone through that file. Shown, I've shown you great examples of 66 million year old apex predators. All right. Now, like I said, each file we explore, we're going to get into more and more a complexity. We're about to get into the unbelievable. <coughs> okay, guys. What? Well, uh, real quick before I go into the next long file, let me go ahead and get make sure my my audio is still good. You're still with me. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Piscean Kiwi, you didn't like those spiders, huh? Okay, we're done with spiders. We're done with spiders. Thank you, Jen, Jamie, Gnostic Baseball. Let's do it. Let's get in that next file, guys. We got some, we got some ground to cover. All right. Next file, reptiles. Let me show you a crocodile. This is a crocodile, guys. Look at the skin that's intact. Look at all this. Now, the only problem, I can agree with science that the apex predator known as a crocodile, oh, uh, no, I can agree with science that, that, that the crocodile would be an apex predator. Well, I have, where I, what I have a problem with is why does the apex predator have to stop evolving according to your model? I don't understand. What's the litmus test? Who gets to decide what life forms get to evolve and which ones don't? Because if the crocodile is an apex predator and therefore it doesn't evolve anymore, then you have to tell me the tadpole is too and the cricket. Yeah, I'm about to show you some other apex predators that are going to blow your mind. Totally dissolves the argument into, into ludicrousness. Yeah, there's a show called Ludicrousness. You ought to check it out. Don and I watch it every once in a while. Yeah. So... A lot, a lot of attention was drawn to this, and I don't know why, because it's not a mystery to me that birds are also in the fossil record. They try to hide it, and they try to cleverly say, oh, look, this is a feathered dinosaur. No, BS, BS, this is a bird. It's right here, very clear, this is a bird. Oh, uh, oh, you got to understand, guys, even today, even today, it is understood by by uh, paleo uh, in uh, paleo bio biologists that avians are descended from reptiles, but avians are reptilian. Everything about a bird, once you remove the feathers, is a reptile. So it's a uh, yeah, it's crazy. I mean, the reptiles and birds both lay eggs. They both lay eggs, and this right here should not be a surprise. This is a reptile that had feathers. Therefore, ergo, it was a bird. That's what it was. Oh, look at that. Imagine that. Evolutionary biologists and unif uniformitarians were in a freaking uproar when, when this fossil was found. Look at this. Oh my God, it's got a dinosaur with feathers. No, dimwits. It's a fossilized bird. Look at this. 3D, it's 3D fossil, a 3D fossil. Check this out, guys. It is like a salamander, a small amphibian or reptile that was trapped in amber. Trapped, well, it became amber. There it is right there. So it wasn't just insects, guys, that were getting caught, trapped. Probably pretty small. Reptile, right here. Just a reptile, guys. Just a reptile. Now, I don't think we have anything like this, not even a Komodo dragon today. That thing is truly extinct. This thing's extinct, but it's a reptile. It's just a reptile. It doesn't matter. You can, I mean, I mean, I understand that the, the I understand that the scientific community calls them dinosaurs and all this stuff, but you know what? A dinosaur is only a reptile. It's just a reptile, a reptile or an amphibian. That's it. Calling it a dinosaur is, is, is attributing to it some type of special meaning that isn't really there. It isn't really there. There's another reptile. Another reptile. Another reptile. Another reptile. Here's another reptile. Can't mistake it. Another reptile. Look, look at his positioning. This is what he was doing the instant he was frozen in time. Look at him. His head's even up. Here's another reptile, just a big one. Size of a bull. Another reptile. There's that big bull, the bull-sized reptile again. Like a giant turtle. Here's another reptile. You can tell from the discoloration around it that a lot of that was biology. Part of his body. Here's a winged reptile. 
This one doesn't appear to have feathers. Maybe it just had a membrane. <clears throat> Here's another reptile. We just saw that one, a different picture of it. Here's a snake. Here's just a plain old, just a plain old, oh, 66 million year old apex predator snake. So what are snakes doing existing 66 million years ago at the same time as four-armed reptiles? Because one developed out of the other, right? There's another snake. Look at that. Everybody knows what that is. They're all over the world today. Hell, the Chinese count time on them. They use their shells as calendars. Look at that. A turtle. Look at that. Another turtle. Got some big turtles there. Got some big turtles there, guys. Still turtles. Look at that turtle. You can clearly see the shell and everything on this one. It's just a reptile, guys. Just a reptile. All right. So we're done with that file. And we're about to move on. I'm going to check my chat. All right. Like I said, each file, the fossils are going to get more and more complex. We're going to see some really interesting things, guys. Real interesting things. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, man. This is for sale on eBay. It's real. There's a bunch of them for sale. This is an ammonite. Like a hundred million year old ammonite. Ammonite. What they do when they find the fossil is they highly polish it. And then they sell them. It's a real fossil. There's a lot of them for sale on Etsy and on, uh, on eBay. But <clears throat> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. They're a lot. They're in a lot of private collections and stuff. But these uh, this ammonite. Look, some of the some of its biology was preserved. Tentacles. You can see all that stuff from the, the undersea slug or snail or whatever it was. Here's another one. That's a totally different one. There. It's a, this is what that this is what people do, man. It's a hobby some people have of polishing these. So why was this? Oh, there it is, right there. 77 million years old. That's crazy. This fossil still has its skin. This is what this is why this is such a rare find. This reptile still has its skin. That's crazy. Okay. 66 million years old, still got its skin. Look at that. Please answer for me by uniformitarian uh descriptions. How in the hell can the fossilization process preserve the delicate, delicate membranes of moth wings? Not only preserve their outline, but also the patterning, the color patterning on the wings itself. There's no process in nature that wouldn't destroy so delicate of organism. It'd be done. It'd be done. It would be done. But something happened to, to basically preserve this, uh, what you see. Now, and this is an anomaly, guys. It's the norm. Remember, I'm not showing you anomalies. I'm showing you the norm. Look at this. On the left is a butterfly fossil. On the right is the butterfly as it exists today. You can't make this shit up. That's a 66 million year old apex predator. Look at this. Butterfly fossil. How did that happen? How did it happen? Look at this. This is a fossilized central nervous system on a creature. I'm not making it up. It came straight out of the science journal. Here it is. It's a, it, it, it says at the bottom. I can't even pronounce it. F 
520 million year old creature that was fossilized and it, in the fossilization process the central nervous system of the creature was preserved that's what it says right here at the bottom guys yeah i mean if that's what you believe i don't believe any of that bullshit but i'm just telling you now that's what the scientists are, are promoting i believe it's a fossil i don't and i believe that it was uh uh, the central nervous system was was preserved, but it wasn't 66 million years ago, and it wasn't 520 million years ago. Look at that dragonfly! Look at that dragonfly fossil. So detailed, so detailed. Something else happened here to do that, not fossilization process. Look at that one. Very detailed. Look at that. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You can even see the lines, the vein. You can see the veins in the membrane. These fossils are incredible. Remember, guys, you're looking at you're looking at biological organisms that turn to stone. It's called the Medusa effect. Look at this. I didn't make that up. It's a scientific term. Man, look at these dragonflies. Look. I'm going through them, guys, because there's so many. This doesn't make sense by the uniformitarian model. This is a mega. This is a gigantic butterfly. Come on. It's crazy. <coughs> the only reason it was, so, it was bigger than modern-day butterflies is because of the air pressure and the oxygen. The cellular structure on fish gills. Right here. Let's look a little closer. You're looking at microscopic evidence of fish gills, petrified, still preserved for us to see today. It's amazing. 65 million years. And here are billion-year-old fossil balls. What's a fossil ball? They don't know. It's just something that apparently was some type of living organism. It's the size of a cell. It's microscopic. And they're claiming they're a billion years old. That's our scientists. That's our scientists for you. They should write comic books. Look at that. Look at that detail. Look at those membranes, how they were preserved. That could be a locust or a moth. There's a moth for real. Even its patterning was preserved. The head, you can see the patterning on the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And you can see on the, on the membranes of the wings, the fossil kept true to the patterning, color patterning. Look at this. The antenna are so delicate. They are so perfectly preserved. Look at that. That's so crazy. And the wings. And the wings. And the wings of this moth. The wing, oh, we just saw that one. Look at this. Look at this. A whole bunch of the original colors of the creature were preserved in the stone. Oh, man. We're going somewhere with this, guys. This is not just a presentation of fossils. Look at all this. Man. There's the skin again. This is a different reptile. This is a different creature. There's the skin. What? Are, is that a slug? Is that a slug that got caught? Wow. Couldn't get out of that tree resin. Remember, guys, billions and billions and billions of insects get caught in tree resin all around the world today, but it doesn't turn into amber. It doesn't preserve them like this because every time it rains, all that shit dissolves. <clears throat> Look at this. Something else happened. Look at that. That is some that is some hellified preservation right there. I don't know what this is. It's definitely a tendril, an arm, an appendage. Look at the membranes of these wings absolutely preserved. Now, you do know that some researchers have drilled in into specimens of amber, and they have, they have found out that these bubbles have like 60, 70 to 80 times more oxygen than our, our atmosphere today. Look at these specimens. Look. 
All these wing membranes, perfectly preserved, 66 million years old. <coughs> and yet you can see all these creatures in your backyard today. <coughs> wing membranes fossilized into rock. More wing membranes fossilized into rock. More wing membranes right here. Apex predators. These are dangerous moths right here. Look at that. Hey, look at those. Look at all that stuff preserved. Look at this. It looks like it was painted on there. Look at that. 60, these, these pieces of amber are windows into 66 million years ago when these little insects were apex predators ruling the world right here until they got, until they got cotton tree sap. Here it is. Look at that. Look at this fossil. It's crazy. Here we go. We got some more, we got some more membranes. Real delicate areas. You got spy, you got a arachnid, arachnid anatomy here. Yeah, it just goes on. All these little creatures are alive today. They're everywhere, all over Central East Texas. Look at them. Here they are. All over Central East Texas. They're everywhere. The Orkin man can tell you every single one of these bugs and what they are. That's a nice little preser preservation right there. Look at that. It's just a wing membrane. The rest of the creature's gone. Or, or the rest of the creature's deeper in the stone. But that's just a wing membrane right there. That's amazing. We went through that file pretty good, pretty fast. Pretty fast. Get over here and check my chat again. How am I doing, guys, on, on my audio? Let's see. Yeah, y'all y'all can dignify me with a like. I'd appreciate that. If you like the material, then you hit the like button. As simple as that. <clears throat> You're actually doing yourself a favor. Because if this is the type of material you like, you the more you like this type of material, YouTube starts feeding you that type of material. All right, we are moving forward, guys. We got some incredible fossils to look at. All right. Some of these fossils here are hard to believe. They're just hard to believe. But it's exactly what scientists are telling us happened. When they cleared all the rock and, and all the, the uh, loose material away from this, they found two reptiles locked in combat, frozen in time in the exact stance they were when they died. And the stance that they were in when they died was locked in combat. Here it is. One did not kill the other. They both died simultaneously while fighting each other. This is a Velociraptor and a Protoceratops, and it doesn't even matter what their scientific names are. They're just reptiles. That's all they are. Supposed to be 74 million years old. Two reptiles locked in combat fighting each other were frozen in time. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Here's two predators right here. These are two apex predators in the water. When one, this, this, one is, this is what it says. There's three creatures here. This The one that's getting bit by the big monster one just ate. Just ate a creature. And it's right there in its stomach. And it fossilized. It was preserved. Scientists can see three creatures here. One that one that the smaller one just swallowed, and the bigger one is now biting into him. Just captured him in his jaws. Crazy. Frozen in time at the exact instant that this happened. Yeah. The medium-sized one swallowed a tiny one, and the big ones, the big one just started chomping on the on, on the medium-sized one. Right here. Says it's 155 million years ago. So we're to believe that. Whole ecosystems were fossilized, 
containing almost virtually the same biological organisms, million, like 50 and 60 million years apart. And then it was all fossilized again. 50 and 60 million years apart. And then it was all fossilized again. You got to be retarded to accept, to accept that. Look at this. Some ancient fish turned to stone so quickly that their last meals got preserved inside them. This tiny crustacean called an ostracod was found in the stomach of a petrified fish. Seen here, thanks to an electron microscope, this one is only as wide as the period at the end of this sentence. A whole creature right here, undigested inside of a fossilized fish. Look at this. Oh, here's that saying. Here's here's a better blow ups. Here's a better scene right here of what's going on. That big creature uh, bearing down on the uh, medium sized one after the medium sized one just swallowed a smaller one. It's all here in one picture. They even x rayed it. It's all here in the x ray. It's crazy. What's going on? It's amazing. It's amazing, guys. Just amazing. Died in an instant. Yeah, it's such a famous fossil. They're, they're showing it again. Or I'm showing it again right here. Look at this. This is crazy here. This 248 million year old, uh, what is that? Ichiosaurus get, was giving birth to three babies. What? In the middle of giving birth, you become a fossil? How'd that happen? Look, three babies popping out. Scientists say this 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 creature, this marine creature, was given birth, turned to stone. Look at that, given birth, turned to stone. Look at that little baby, never had a chance. As soon as that little baby popped out, turned into a Medusa effect. Doesn't even make no sense. That's a whole different creature there. Let, let, let me let me look. That is different. That's a totally different. So here's two different fossils given birth. To a baby fossil, 66, over 66 million years ago. There's that famous fossil again, of the two creatures fighting each other. Yeah, guys. So, these two turtles here were having sex. It's crazy. 47 million years ago, these two turtles were getting their bang on right here. And that's all she wrote. Frozen in time. Look at this. Frozen underwater. Get, listen, guys. Fish have to be underwater. When this fish is swallowing another fish and got frozen in time. This fish is swallowing another fish and got frozen in time. Process that. This fish, swimming underwater, swallowing another fish, got frozen in time. The ridiculous paragraphs that I have read in scientific journals are so laughable. Oh, if you notice, it's a big fish. So what happened was the big fish swallowed a fish that it, uh, just, it just couldn't, it couldn't swallow it all the way down. So it, so it died and it, and it went to the bottom of the ocean and it became a fossil. I guess that happened to this one too. Absolutely ridiculous explanations given by when you come up with a ridiculous theory that that tries to account for all the evidence, and then more and more evidence comes that's counterintuitive, and it, it goes to, it's antithetical to anything that that you've promoted. You have to come up with some really stupid explanations as to why things are found the way they are. Here's one: in the middle of swallowing a fish. Here's another one. In the middle of swallowing a fish, frozen in time underwater. So, we're told right here that 41 million years ago, flies were having sex when they got trapped in amber, trapped in tree resin. And of course, you guys have seen this. I've showed you guys this. This has caused a lot of controversy in the scientific and creationist communities. The radio polonium halos that have been found in granite. It's very interesting, guys, because 
<coughs> you cannot melt granite uh, and, and stay granite. The fact that radio polo, radio halos have been found of polonium been found in granite is a true mystery. The reason it's mysterious is because the radio halos have a half-life of about half a second, and then they're gone. So how in the hell can we take granite all over the world and, and look at a look at it under an electron microscope and see radio polonium halos? How do you see the radio halos? They're not supposed to be there. They're gone within a half a second of, of the polonium, uh, uh, the creation of the polonium. How are they trapped in granite? If you melt granite, it becomes rhyolite. You can't do it, guys. You just can't. So the the plum, the radio, they don't give off new halos when granite's melted into a, well, when you melt it, make it molten, and then it dries. It's no longer granite. It's rhyolite. So this is a real mystery, guys, but it's not a mystery. It's not a mystery to a simulationist. It's a mystery to a catastrophist. It's a mystery to a uniformitarian. And they've come up with all kinds of little ingenious ways to, to say one or the other. But in simulation theory, there is an explanation for this. And we'll get to it. Okay, this right here. You, It's really hard to see. Scientists have x-rayed this. And they say it's a snake coiled ready to eat an egg. It's a, it's a snake about to eat an egg. The snake is like wrapped around a plant and it's about to eat an egg when it got frozen in time. It's hard to see, guys. There's no sense trying to look at it. It's, just, it's out of a scientific journal. Look at this. This spider here was, was, about, to wrap, was about to wrap this uh, fly when he got frozen in time or, or trapped in the... Uh, trapped in the um, the resin, and then the resin preserved it, frozen in time. So this is all this is all very compelling. But like I said, we're going somewhere with this. We got we got some fossils that are going to give you some aha moments. Yeah, and for those of you before you get triggered, we're not talking about the Great Flood. We're not talking about a flood event here. It's not, it's not, that does not answer for the existence of all these fossils at all. Staying retired. Uh, why is Jason taking these examples from comic books? Uh, did you misinterpret something or are you trolling? Because I'm not going to accept any bullshit on my channel. And none of these examples from comic books. You need you need to provide an explanation, man. You already know I have zero tolerance. I have no problem permanently removing people from my chat. So we're gonna go to the next the next file here. <clears throat> All right. So you guys know this is a crab. Why why is a crab fossil significant? Was well, significant for the same reason that a fish fossil is significant. This is deep sea. This file here contains all deep sea fossils. That's a problem. That's a real problem, especially when you see what some of these fossils are. The fossilization process apparently isn't wasn't just the surface, the dry surface. It's also deep in the ocean. We're going to see some things that just begin not to make sense according to the standard models. These are all crabs frozen in time. 3D, 3D fossils here. No immense amount of pressure, no crushing, none of that stuff happened here. That's in the uniformitarian model as to how to create a fossil. No, that's here. Look at this. You can even see the eyes and stuff. Look at that. 3D fossil. <coughs> Look at these plants. These were delicate plants, undersea plants. Look at this. This is amazing. These are crinoids. 
These are undersea plants. These are crinoids, guys. These delicate. There's no way they should be so perfectly preserved in 3D. Look at this. Amazing. Here's here now. You, here's something you need to take in consideration. You're looking at an undersea plant as it's in full bloom, floating in the water. It was frozen. It was absolutely frozen in time while it was underwater. Had it been removed from the water, though all the uprights would be hanging down. Yeah, guys, it was still in water when it was frozen. Oh, those are the crinoids again. Look, this thing was this thing was was standing straight up, floating in water. There's a fish with it. You can still see its eye fossilized. It's a 3D fish. It's an ugly fish. It's another fish. Look at all these fish, guys. This isn't the exception. It's the norm. Fish fossils are found everywhere. Look at this. Fish fossils. Fish fossils. I'm going through the fish fossils because it's not, I'm just showing you how, how many there are. There's so many. And there's way more than I'm showing. I'm just trying to hammer in the point that this is the norm. It's not the exception. Fossils are everywhere. The entire world died. This is what you need to, need to understand. This wasn't highly localized. This wasn't regional, hemisphere, continental. The entire world died. And I'm going to show you show you more evidence of this. Look at all these fish fossils. Here it is again. Now, here's what here's where we get into some, uh, a, a true, genuine uh, anomaly. Okay, this is coral. But what makes this interesting to geologists is this isn't just coral that's found in the ocean. This is fossilized coral. It's coral that turned to literal stone instead of the bone accre accretions that it actually is. Coral is created by microorganisms in the, in the sea, and it becomes like a bone accretion in, underwater. But this, this was a, it's still it's still it's still semi biological, but this is fossilized coral. This is fossilized coral, not normal coral. This is fossilized coral. It became petrified again. The Medusa effect. This has been polished because because of its beauty. This is fossilized coral. Again, fossilized coral. Here's more that's been polished because of its beauty. Guys, fossilized coral's not the norm. Coral's everywhere. It's all over the world. But for it to be fossilized, it fossilized at the exact same time as all these other pictures of turtles, grasshoppers, dragonflies, butterflies, fish, everything I've showed you, reptiles, they all fossilized at the exact same time. There's more. It's all fossil coral. This is an index fossil, meaning for a long time, these pontificating evolutionary scientists were all claiming that anything found in the strata with the coelocanth right here must be a certain age, like 70 million years old. And they dated hundreds of, of, spot, of fossil species according to this index dating created using the coelocanth. And then five coelocanth have been found since the 1920s. Yeah, they've been found very recently too, like within the last decade. Cetocanth are everywhere. An index fossil, which is 70 million years old, is still swimming in our seas today. It's an apex predator. How do you fossilize a jellyfish? How do you do it? It's an invertebrate. It's got no bones. How do you fossilize a jellyfish? We got a whole bunch of specimens. It's not, it is not the, the, uh, the exception, guys. It's the norm. Fossilized jellyfish have been found everywhere. 
They're in collections all over the world. Fossilized jellyfish have been found everywhere. Look at that jellyfish. Look at that. Look at the left. There's, there's one today on the right. There it is. There he is on the left. There's another one. Fossilized jellyfish. Okay, well, check this out. For those of you who don't know, when you go to Red Lobster and you eat a lobster, you're eating an apex predator from 70 to 66 million years ago. They are absolutely unchained, unchanged. Here's a lobster right here. Here's another lobster, unchanged apex predator. There it is. There's another lobster. Or a different, that's, that's a different vantage point of the same one I just showed. But here's a different lobster. Look at that one. If you can't see a lobster there, there's something wrong with you. Look at that lobster. Look at these lobsters. None of these fossils that I've shown you show creatures that are in the throes of death. They're all doing their normal activities. <coughs> that could be a lobster <coughs> or a crawdad. Look at that specimen. That's a lobster. Look at this. Octopus suction, suction cups. How'd that happen? How did that delicate tissue get preserved all these years? 66 million years old. Yeah, octopuses, that's just crazy. It's crazy, guys, when you process this. There's another crinoid deep in the ocean. Here's a 3D fossil deep in the ocean. These crinoids everywhere. S sand dollar, deep underwater, perfectly preserved. Here's another Here's another marine, marine reptile, fish. Some other type of marine creature, ammonite. Preserved in 3D. Another ammonite. This guy's pulling up ammonites. They're beautiful shells, but they exist today. There's no difference in the ones today and, and, and those that were found in ancient times. Look at these. Look at that shrimp. Little popcorn shrimp right there. Popcorn shrimp apex predator. 66 million years old. It's amazing. There's another one. There's his friend. Here's a squid. How do you how do you fossilize a squid? He ain't got no bones. There's another squid right there. Look at that. Look at look at how that was preserved. That creature is not in the throes of death. That creature is doing its normal business when it died. There's another one. Another squid. Oh, look at the starfish. All right. Another starfish. That starfish is doing its normal business. This is what a living starfish would look like. It's just moving its legs around, slowly moving across, feeding, bottom feeding on the uh, uh, ocean floor. Look. They're not in the throes of death. They're not curled up like arachnids and spiders. Like all the insects you saw that were in the amber, it's because they died. They folded up and died as the amber was still a gel, liquefied. The, the spider, a lot of the spider's legs fold up. They die. They have time. They have time for rigor mortis to set in. They have time for, all, for the tightening of all that. But you know what? You don't see this in all these fossils. No, oh, they died instantly. Performing their normal, normal business. Little be baby starfish and stuff in here. It's crazy. Trilobites. Yeah, these things are supposed to be 500 million years old. Trilobites everywhere. Trilobites. 
Look at this. Look at that specimen of nerve. Tiny. <laughs> Look at these things. Very well preserved. Very well preserved. We just saw that one. These are trilobites. This is a species that did not continue as we know today. If they're on the bottom of the ocean beds, we ain't found them yet. This is a species that no longer exists. Trilobites. Look at those crinoids. Look at these. What you're seeing, what you're seeing here is what these would look like underwater as the water, as they're flowing in the current. They were flash frozen in time and then petrified into stone right here. Here they are. Again, you're looking at plants' normal behavior in water. There it is right there. Normal behavior in water. I don't know what kind of creature that is. I don't even know what kind of fossil this is, guys. Or this one. There's some of these that are bizarre. I don't know what this is. It's definitely some type of creature. I don't know what it is, but it's... I'm not going to try and guess. All right, we're moving through these files better than I thought. We got three files left. Oh, we got some good ones, too. Let me check my chat. Let me check my chat, guys. Man, the only thing that would make this video better is if I had some coffee to drink, but I'm okay. I'm a survivor. Let's see. All right, so we're still sounding pretty good. Thank you, Shackled by Illusion. <coughs> All right, let's move on. All right, we're going to get to these fossil clams now. I'm going to I'm going to post the link in the description box at the end of this video so you can go to on YouTube and watch this guy's videos. He's got a really compelling channel. He's got 87,000 subs or so. I think he deserves a lot more. Um uh he, co he covers a lot of the stuff that I do on my channel, but uh, he, he may focus a lot more just on the creationi creationism perspective, and uh, that's okay. But he goes into fossils and Great Flood, and, and it's pretty compelling stuff he's got. Uh, I'm going to give you his full name and, and the link to his channel and, and the videos. But one of his videos had some, had some material. That really, that really shocked me because I just did five videos on the Ogaijian Deluge explaining to you guys that South America, Peruvian mountains, the Andes were shoved, were shoved up 14,000 feet elevation in 1687 BC. And, it, and that is exactly why a video on his channel stood out to me about giant clams found at 12,000 foot altitude. So... Really interesting material. So here's what you need to know about clams. This is a normal size clam, but it's a fossil. But the reason it's mysterious is because it's a closed shell. This is a bivalve. It's a closed shell fossil. That's not natural. When a clam or an oyster, a scallop dies, the muscles relax and the shell opens. This is what happens. This is why shells are all over the beach in the halves. You find the halves all the time. You almost never find the hole because when they die, their muscles relax. So the fossils that have been found of clams and, and, and scallops and oysters are of closed shells. That means they were alive and well when they died. And it further means they turned to stone before they could open. Look, closed shells, closed shell clams are not supposed to happen. When they die, they're supposed to open. 
And this is how we find them today. This is what happens today. More fossils right here. These are fossils that have been polished, <coughs> but they're closed shells, meaning that poor creature was turned to stone before the shells could open. Again, here's a perfect example. Closed shell scallops right here. They weren't able to open before they petrified. Now, here's another very interesting thing. I'm pretty sure a lot of you have never heard of this, but everything you see on this, on this image right here is a fossilized pearl. Not, not a pearl like we have today from oysters and clams and scallops, but a fossil pearl that was a real pearl at the time of this event. The scallops, clams, and oysters, when this event occurred, had already died and opened, and the pearls were exposed. Currents and other animals knock them loose, and they're on the ocean floor, and they get buried in sediments and whatever happens. And when this event took place, these pearls turned to stone. Here it is. These are pearls, according to science, according to geologists, these are pearls that have petrified. Now, in the, in the 1940s, some, a, a paleontologist visited the site in Peru <clears throat> because it was rumored there were some gigantic clams all over the ground and they were still closed. He went and surveyed the area and basically concluded that, yeah, there's a whole bunch of gigantic clams all over the ground. It's like 10 to 12,000 foot elevation in the Peruvian mountains. It doesn't make any sense. They're gigantic. But being large does not disqualify them. Why? Because everything was gigantic at certain times in the distant past. So we're not surprised about giant clams. The only surprise is the elevation at 10, 10 to 12,000 feet. But I've already explained in 1687 BC during the Ogaijian Deluge, Tiwanaku, Pumapunka, Lake Titicaca, the whole area was raised to 12,000 foot elevation. And this is why the, the quays, the docking areas, the ancient fossilized coast, the beaches are all fossilized and they're there and they've been found. The Poznansky knew this uh, uh, in 1901, 1902, and 1903 when he was at Tiwanaku excavating these things. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting. So somebody recently followed up on this research, and they went and took pictures of, the, of these. And, yeah, you have to understand, they're, they don't really look like clams anymore, giant clams. But then again, they kind of do. Here they are. Somebody went and followed up on it. And yeah, there's a lot of, you get, believe me, uniformitarians are always going to have other professionals come attack it and all that. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's people saying, no, they're just normal rock outcrops. They're just normal boulders. Look at this. Does this look normal to you? No. That doesn't look normal at all. Giant clams over, over thousands and thousands, I'm not talking about millions of years, but over thousands of years of exposure, they're going to be subject to the weather. They're going to, they're going to wear out. But the researcher did notice that they, many of them do have ridges just like clams have. They even have the shape of clams and they're all also in a colony together like clams. Colon clams are in colonies. So yeah, guys, this is really interesting material. Remember, this whole area was at sea level or below sea level prior to 1687 BC. Here they are again. These are supposed to be giant clams. And I understand a lot, a lot of people want to say they're not. And you know what? I don't even care if they are or if they're not. Because giant clams do exist in the world. If these aren't, then that would be a surprise. But then again, it wouldn't. I don't really, I really don't care neither here nor there. Because I know it's I know it's highly possible. There's a giant shells in Peru. Here's the original article right here. I want you guys to go check out this guy's videos and channels. Pretty good. It's pretty good stuff. Here's the, here's the original picture. This was this is an actual article written by uh, a paleontologist who surveyed the site. He believes they're fossilized fossilized mollusks. Uh, uh, he's, he's saying that they're 200 million years old in the Andes Mountains range. 
uh, once submerged in the ocean. He says the bank, the bank itself actually has 500 of these giant, giant oysters. So this is a, this is a scientist that says all this. And of course, others have come behind him. And, and that's, that's what the scientific community does. They try to debunk everything that, 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 uh, that basically undermines their cherished and bogus uniformitarian theory of natural selection and evolutionary development. So I thought that was a really interesting file there. We two more files to go, guys. Two more files to go. We'll go, to, we'll go to this short one here. Here's a real short file. Now, fossils are interesting. You've already seen ammonites, but the only difference here is this ammonite was fossilized and became pure opal. A semi-precious stone, pure opal. Now, that's interesting because this too is pure opal, and you can't like 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 the shell. A detractor could always say somebody carved that to look like a shell. That's fine. What about this one? This specimen of pure opal actually has a fossilized creature inside of it. Here it is, right here. All these fossils right here in this guy's hand are opal. These are they all were fossilized and became opal. This ammonite right here still has some rock rock accretion right over here. It's been polished, but it also is opal. It has opal in it. Now I, I'm familiar with other fossils that were that have been found, like in geodes that were agate. <coughs> so these things don't. The last one was a nautilus. So these things don't really, they don't they don't really surprise me at all at all. So I'm not really surprised. <laughs> All right. So anyway, we have one more file to go before before oh we get into a little little discussion about this. This last file shows that our world is not what you think, guys. It's just not. We're going to look at human artifacts, fossilized. Now, <coughs> what you're seeing here should not exist. <coughs> and it's a real big problem for uniformitarians. It was very widely published. And they try, and they try, they, you know, the scientists really try hard to, uh, to discredit it. Like they do anything that, that attacks their, their theory. But scientific analysis of fossilized boot prints, we're talking about sandals or boots human, a human or a humanoid was wearing. The problem is, is that the rock strata is dated at 240 million years old. The reason it's dated at that is because crushed underneath the fossilized sandal print, is this little critter here. That's a trilobite. And scientists identified that as a trilobite from 240 million years ago based off their own model of how they date geological formations. Therefore, the sandal prints had to be 240 million years old too, which creates a problem. Science doesn't want to talk about this discovery in 1968 because they refuse to believe that sandals on human feet existed 240 million years ago. But what I'm seeing here is what I'm seeing here is human sandals crushed a living trilobite to death. That's all I'm seeing. I don't attach 240 million years ago because I don't believe that BS paradigm. I'm going with the facts. And the fact is, a human wasn't paying attention when he crushed a bug, a trilobite, and killed him. And he was wearing something to protect his feet. And these footprints got fossilized just shortly after that because the trilobite is still there, preserved. 
This could have happened 6,600 years ago. Now, <clears throat> this is famous. This is an actual iron hammer with almost zero oxygen content, meaning that the refining process, removing the dross, the metallurgy was advanced. This iron hammer right here still has the wood going through it, but it was found in solid rock that was dated at 100 million years old. Do you really think that somebody dropped a hammer 100 million years ago? Or do you think maybe that a 200-year-old theory about how to date rock might be a little wrong? This is founding in, in London, Texas. This is another famous find. This is a human, this is what is believed by many to be a human finger skeleton. It's also been x-rayed and the x-rays also show a concentration in the center where a bone would be or where bones would be in knuckles. There it is. That's another famous find. Here's another one. It's totally different. It's another finger found. I don't know why it's so hard to believe that fingers are found everywhere. If you read the Old Testament, you'll find out the Israelites are going around chopping toes and fingers off their enemies. Didn't Adon Adonai Zedek get his great toes chopped off? Look at this. Human footprint right here. Fossilized. Fossilized footprints. It's not, it's not unusual, guys. Scientists have been documenting a lot of these. These are, these are, these are foot, footprints right here. This, these footprints aren't human. This is a sauropod that was running for its life in an attempt to escape a predator. That's, that's what it says. I don't know, I don't know where they got the story from, but that's what they say. Here's some fossil eye. here. So well, my, my point is this. Glen Rose, Texas and the Paluxy River has three-toed gigantic reptilian, uh, you can lay in them, uh, reptilian uh, footprints going up and down the Paluxy River. I've laid in them. I, I've, been to, I've been to the Paluxy River in Glen Rose, Texas twice in my life. It's called Dinosaur National Park. I've been there as a kid twice in, my in the 80s. I've laid in those rocks. I've played, I played in, those, in that park. And I'm going to tell you now. There's petrified reptilian footprints found all over the world. So it shouldn't be a surprise to find that we find human footprints petrified all over the world as well. But what should surprise you, look at it, there's another one. What should surprise you, or what, what doesn't what doesn't surprise me, but should, but should surprise most people, is that here, look at all these footprints documented in 1950s. Human footprints. Here's what should really shock you. I've been here. This is Glen Rose Dinosaur Park. This is how they excavate the shale. They get that shale off, that outer cover of sedimentation, and they look underneath it to see what's there. They found dinosaur and human footprints in the same in the same bed. It's right here. That doesn't really surprise me because they're not dinosaurs. They're just reptiles. They're just reptiles, guys. I've been here, Dinosaur Valley State Park. Look at that. This is a fossil. It's a human handprint turned to stone. Another human handprint turned to stone. Here's a here's a uh, here's a giant reptile foot going over a human footprint. Yeah, guys. And then we get here. I'm gonna give you the links to this so you can go to that guy's website. I pulled the I pulled these Malta tracks and the oysters, the giant oysters and the tracks on, on Malta. I pulled from his uh, channel. I'm gonna give you the links in the description box as soon as this video is over. But th these tracks are amazing. These tracks have been found all over the world. They've been found in New Mexico, in Arizona. They have been found in Texas, outside of Austin, and they've been found on Malta. And I'm pretty sure. In David Hatcher Childress's books, he has other places like in Greece somewhere they've, they've been found as well. As if there were wheeled mechanisms back then. And uh, they petrified. 
What's really crazy is these are absolutely uniform and they go long distances all over Malta, uh, Austin, uh, Arizona. Yeah, there's petrified tracks. The key here is uniform uniformity. They, these are parallel. These are parallel tracks that remain uniform everywhere they go, showing it was a wheeled mechanism. Petrified. That's a controversial discovery. I didn't really get a lot of them because there. I have a file full of them, but but I mean, people are just going to cry, cry, cry foul over and over and over. But this is supposed to be a screw. It's been analyzed to, to, to determine what type of metal it would have been. It, it, it's got. It's, it's controversial, but. You know, other people talk about it as a crinoid stem or whatever. It doesn't matter. I don't even care what it is. Just, it doesn't even matter to me. Here's some tracks some more. Here's more tracks petrified. More tracks petrified. Vehicle tracks petrified. Yeah, guys. The, uh, the ancient world. Let's see if I had anything here. Yeah, that was John Adolfi channel, Lost World Museum, Giant Clams in Peruvian Mountains. I got the link for that and the link for his channel and the link for his channel. We'll get to that in a little while. I'm gonna stop removing all that. I haven't even looked at my time. One hour and fifty-five minutes, guys. You just reviewed three hundred and forty something images. Oh, your takeaway from this, your takeaway from this is that the standard uniformitarian model could not be true. The the wing membranes, the delicate silica that you can see, the, the excuse me, the cilia, the little hairs on instead on insects and on plants, it's it was preserved way too well. Internal organs, central nervous systems, all these things preserved in stone. The story that we have been given that fossils take a long time to make and that there's a, it's a process of mineralization, of decomposing of biology is not true because decomposing biology can't, can't maintain its structure to be preserved in stone so meticulously as we just saw. It's not true. But we don't even need, we don't even need all, all these, all these different Oh, examples and visual examples. Just the whole, the whole idea is just, is just ridiculous. These pictures are evidence not of the fossilization process as science has, has, has dictated. Because we can't trust science. Who believes a scientist anymore? Who is still believing that BS that we went to the moon? Who's still believing in the hominids when every single one that's been found has been basically been been a hoax. It's been a hoax. Piltdown Man was a great hoax, but it's not the only one. It was pig bones. And they had to perpetuate hoax hoaxes, just like NASA has to get Tesla on board with SpaceX to perpetuate the lie that we're still doing things in space. That's why NASA needed to get India on board to perpetuate the lie that we're still doing things on the moon. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all BS. The world that has been presented to us from the scientific community is from a playbook. That playbook is to get us to look at all, all history in a totally different and false way. Just like the Ice Age theories. I've told you guys over and over and over the evidence in the 1800s and the early 20th century for Ice Ages was the biological organisms that were found in the millions packed under the tundra of Siberia, northern Russia, across Alaska, and Canada, and North America. And all these woolly rhinoceroses, and these woolly mammoths, and these mastodons, and these three-toed sloths, and these saber lynx, these saber lynx tigers, and, and uh, saber-toothed tigers, all these giant badgers, all these creatures. It is now known, it is now widely known, that the hair that they had cooled them it allowed it allowed wind breezes to pass through the hair where their sweat glands released released moisture to keep their bodies cool not to keep them warm from the arctic the story we have been told is total bs you guys know 
many researchers have come out now and said, man, these giant creatures weren't living in an Arctic world. They weren't living, never even seen snow before. They've never lived in that type of world. All that came after the vapor canopy. They died after the vapor canopy collapsed. But I'm not even talking about the collapse of the vapor canopy. The, the vapor canopy collapse completely killed the megafauna world. But I haven't showed you any fossils of megafauna because there are none. This is a key. This is a fundamental key that you need to understand. You guys know by watching my presentations, Ice Age is a hoax. It's all bullshit. As soon as a vapor canopy collapses, that's where you get your two miles high, high uh, snow caps. They get compressed over centuries until the next vapor canopy forms. How does that vapor canopy form? When there's volcanoes under the ocean spewing so much stuff, and then the, the worldwide temperature starts going up. Greenhouse effect, increased pressure, ambient radi radiation, ultraviolet light passing through the vapor canopy from, from the sun. The sky begins to darken, and what happens? The polar extremities melt rapidly, adding to the humidity, adding to the pressure, adding to the vapor canopy. It is a cycle, and this cycle doesn't take millions of years. It takes a couple thousand. Now, this is why we have maps from the 13, 14, and 1500s that show an ice-free Iceland, Greenland, and Antarctica. This is why we have those maps. There's no ice. We can see the rivers. We can see the deltas. We can see the mountain ranges exactly where they are today. These maps exist because there was no vapor camp, because there was no ice, two-mile-high ice sheet when the maps were made, which was six and 700 years ago. Now, <coughs> here's... Here's what happened according to the archaics simulation theory model. You guys know that all the calendars that I've I, I have I all the calendars that I have studied and revealed to you guys, numerous different calendrical systems from the ancient world, were all basically stemmed from one primal calendar, the Anunnaki Nur system of 600 year periods, which has nothing to do with an astronomical cycle, but has everything to do with these key nodal points in our timeline where new things appear in the world. That timeline began in 5239 BC and is specifically attached to the Nemesis Cataclysm. The Nemesis Cataclysm is when our sister star imploded. And when it did, it caused all kinds of destruction. And in the Archaics model, we are now existing inside a simulation that has been running multiple times with multiple resets, multiple reboots, so we can figure out survival rates and what we can best do to survive when this situation happens. For some reason in 5239 BC in our calendar now, somebody pulled the switch. And when they did, everything in the world flash froze. Process this. Plants and animals a half a mile under water have all been found perfectly fossilized in the positions that they would have been in had they just been doing their normal routines, eating other fish, giving birth, feeding, feeding, swimming, crawling on the ocean bottom. If everything fossilized from the highest mountains all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, then everything in the construct ceased operating. Everything died. That's what the fossil record shows. It shows 100% death of everything in the construct. Somebody pulled the switch, system off, and it's not a death of throws type death. It is an instantaneous turn off. Everything's turned off frozen in time exactly where it was. Even the oceans instantly froze. That's how those fish were found the way they were, perfectly preserved. And then as it thaws out over time, they've already mineralized, they've already fossilized. And then they just freely fall into the mud. Some of them break them. We found pieces of fossils, some of them break. But fossils were created instantly a half a mile underwater and at 14,000 feet elevation. 
in the mountains. So we're talking about the entire biosphere killed in an instant. That's what we find. Why are all these insects so perfectly preserved and tiny reptilians so perfectly preserved in amber? Because that amber was just tree resin when the event happened. And just like today, there are insects in every forest trapped in tree resin. Nothing has changed. Crickets are not apex predators. And neither are butterflies. And yet they're perfectly preserved. Not only are they perfectly preserved, but they exist in our backyards today with tadpoles and crawfish. And go to the beach and there's crabs. Nothing has changed. When this event occurred, there doesn't seem to be any mammalian life forms. How do we know this? Because they didn't fossilize. They weren't here. They had not yet been delivered. I have videos that show that, that life forms don't develop on Earth. They're brought here. Something in the sky opens and dumps reptiles, dumps tadpoles, dumps amphibians, dumps rivers of crickets, dumps, dumps whole clouds of monarch butterflies. I've got this on my channel. Where did I get it? I got it from the historical record. And I cited those sources where I got that material. Remember, when I am putting together material for videos, I always have to make sure that every piece fits into the paradigm. And it does fit. It does fit. Nothing was developed here. This construct is, is nothing but a series of simulated biospheres. And in the biosphere of the Nemesis Cataclysm, 5239 BC, it was lights out. Somebody had decided we're starting over. Somebody had decided we're starting over. And when they started over, there was a filtering process. Imagine a giant filter right here. On the other side of that filter is a teeming world of amphibians and reptiles and insects. And there's people there trying to survive. There's humans there trying to survive. It's only 7,000 years ago. And then somebody pulled the switch saying it's not working. This sim is not working. We're not developing the way we need to. We're not solving the problems we need to solve. Something's not right. And we need more resources. It's not working. We need to figure out a better way. So they punch the lever back on. The sim turns back on. And somebody has already gone through the selection process. And they decided that butterflies, great white sharks, millipedes, mosquitoes, crocodiles, uh, uh, crin uh, not crinoids, but... Uh, jellyfish can all continue and a whole host of other fossils i just showed you that are in your backyard today and turtles and fish and they decided somebody decided hey all these can continue they're going to continue in the next biosphere no development no transitional forms get all that shit out of your head because some jackass in 1817 made all that stuff up anyway this this sim next the next the next biosphere you know if you follow somebody like gg young I have some respect for Gigi Young. Very different type of information. But she's literally saying the same thing I am, or I'm saying the same thing she is. She calls them epochs. There's really no difference here because I'm speaking from a technologically advanced perspective. The next sim, they, they pull that lever, and now it, it reboots, but there's something new added. What's new? are the megafauna. Now we have two different types of megafauna. We have marsupials and we have mammals. We have placentals that, that are introduced in and the marsupials. And hey, somebody's decided that that uh, we need all these new life forms like tigers and elephants, tigers and elephants and badgers and, and kangaroos. And it's a totally different type world. We don't find fossilized, we don't find fossilized mammals and we don't find fossilized marsupials because they weren't on the other side of the nemesis cataclysm. The last time the entire world died was 5239 BC, which started all these calendrical systems that I've documented on my channel, starting with the Anuna, the Anuna 
the ancient Sumerian Anunnaki calendar that everybody pretends didn't exist, and yet I've showed all these sources showing you that it did. 5239 BC, that world ended with the Nemesis Cataclysm. Instantaneously, every life form in the world died. Sometime after that, somebody turned the system back on with a filtering system that allowed many, many, many life forms to continue un un unabated. But what was introduced were mammalian and megafauna. It's a whole new sim. It's a whole, we're in a simulation, guys. If you haven't got there yet, you probably don't have any business even listening to this video because none of this is going to make sense. This video is actually from our archaic veterans who have seen all the thousands of data points showing that this is a simulated construct, not a real reality. There's no way to process all this fossilization stuff outside that context. You are in a construct and somebody decided to introduce new biological life forms and they all appeared at the same time. And they're all, there's no development whatsoever. They were marsupial and they were megafauna. Megafauna are the basic the predecessors of our modern mammals who had to adapt. Was it evolutionary adaptation? Absolutely not. They had to adapt because the next time the world suffered a massive cataclysm. It wasn't all out destruction to the entire world. It was the great flood of 2239 BC when the vapor canopy collapsed. When the vapor canopy collapsed, all of a sudden, 2.2 million mastodons and mammoths and three-toed sloths and gigantic bison and all these megafauna life forms that have been found across Alaska, Canada, North America, Siberia, Russia, and Mongolia died within minutes with tulips on their mouth. Not in the Arctic. They died because, according to modern science, they couldn't breathe. Process that. They, they asphyxiated. This is in the scientific reports about the megafauna. They asphyxiated. Why? I've already explained it. When the vapor canopy collapsed, the atmospheric pressure was gone and it could no longer contain that enriched oxygen that we find when we take an amber fossil, drill into it and go to an air bubble and analyze that air bubble. It's got 60, 70, 80, maybe 100 times more oxygen content than the air that we're breathing right now. So the megafauna die off and, and, and the ones that survive do so in the temperate areas and they learn to adapt. They never. They, they were easily easy prey. A bunch of them died off. Many, many, many species died out when the vapor canopy collapsed because they couldn't breathe. Humans were no longer titans and giants uh, that existed during the pre-flood world because we were gigantic. But our titanic fathers and mothers, when they had sons and daughters after the collapse of the vapor canopy, they weren't titanic. They were just, they were just gigantic. They were smaller, though. But they weren't even realized, it wasn't even realized that they were gigantic until they had sons and daughters within a generation after the collapse of the vapor canopy, the day the sky fell, the great flood. Because now normal sized humans were born, which is us today, who can breathe just fine right now. But our gigantic moms and dads could not really breathe. And it was very easy during the campaigns of Keto Laramore in Genesis chapter 14 and 15 for normal sized humans to armor up and go to war with five races of giants and beat them because we move faster, we can breathe better. It was easy to slay the giants. And this was after the Titans had all died out. Why did the Titans die out? Because they couldn't do anything in the new world. In the new world, they could barely breathe, so they could never move around. In one generation after the Great Flood, the Titans were already dying out. The giants were their sons and daughters. And then a generation after that, the giant sons and daughters of the giants were normal-sized humans. It's really simple. This is what the historical record shows, removing all the mythological elements. <coughs> so... This is, like I said, this is really for my archaic veterans because new people to my channel, you probably think I'm insane madman. You just have no idea how much data that I have to support all this material. It's a, 
But that's my presentation, guys. I'm not going to take it any longer than it needed to be. You just heard exactly the business. You saw the pictures. And that is my interpretation. That is exactly the chronology. We had a very unusual amphibian and reptilian world with humans in it prior to 5239 BC. And I don't know how long it was, but somebody decided to pull the plug. And when they plugged it back in, they had removed many life forms that we find only in fossil form. And yet, hundreds of thousands of other fossils are still living today. Yeah, guys. And be careful. When you go outside, make sure you don't have any run-ins with some apex predator cricket. Absolutely ridiculous, God. Absolutely ridiculous. Check my chat again. Hope you guys enjoyed this presentation. I do have, just like my intro has new elements to it, my outro's got some new stuff in it too. Too, I did I did all new intros and outros. I, I revamped them. I increased the music. <coughs> I love you guys, man. And we got a great pyramid video coming up. My next live presentation will be about three days from now. It'll be three or four days from now, and it's going to be about the Great Pyramid. I'm going to give you guys the business. You guys know I got a whole playlist on the Great Pyramid, but I'm going to try to sum up the salient points in chronological order uh, in one presentation live. I'm going to show you a bunch of badass slides, guys, a bunch of them. But yeah, it's uh, like I said, peace out. <laughs>